Hello again, my name is Matthew Goodwin, and I'm going to bring you a sermon entitled The Reality of Persecution Part 2, and we're going to talk about different things involving persecution and bring in more to the surface of what the Bible says about persecution. Now, however, before we get to that, I just want to say to all the families and the victims that were affected here recently in the shooting in Orlando between Grimmy being shot praying for her family and her friends, between the shooting at the Pulse nightclub, I am praying for each and every one of you. And I'm also praying for the hostage situation that happened in Texas and the shooting that happened in Chicago as well. I am praying for all of these people that have been affected this past weekend by these tragic events. And I pray that God will reveal himself to you and to your family. But persecution, what is persecution? Nick Ripkin talked about how persecution in his book, The Reality or the, the, the Insanity of Obedience, he talked about how persecution is an act of a particular group or person trying to keep another group of people or person from seeing who Jesus is. That is noted in The Insanity of Obedience by Nick Ripkin. And he makes a good valid point. In my personal opinion, this past weekend was not only an act of terrorism, but it was also an act of persecution. Yeah, the ra this radical Muslim did not believe homosexuality was right, and that's why he did it. But at the same time, he kept these people from seeing who Jesus was. And that's an act of persecution. Christians can persecute non-believers by condemning them, by having a set of traditionalism values to the point where, oh, you're wearing shorts, you can't come into the church building. Oh, you're a homosexual, you can't come into the church building. That is an act of persecution, whether Christians understand that or not. So in this, we're going to talk about praying for our persecutors. Nick Ripkin mentioned in his book that whenever you experience persecution, pray for them. Don't pray that it's going to end because persecution, as noted in the last sermon, part one, that it will never end. As long as you are in the obedience of God, sharing your faith with other believers, discipling, being part of the body of Christ, you will experience persecution. And it's not up to you to pray to God to ask him to stop because even in Matthew, which we'll look at in a second, said, Jesus says, I'm sending you among wolves and I want you to be sheep. And if you're not knowing what that means, it means that Jesus wants us to be gentle, but he also wants us to be loving. In that same context, it says, be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. That's what he wants us to be. But wolves will attack sheep, and that's the persecution. So if you have your Bible, and if you don't, then that's okay. He flips the book of Matthew 5.10, chapter 5, verse 10. This is talk, this, Jesus is talking to the multitude on um, the sermon, and he's telling him this. It's the Sermon on the Mount, and he's telling them this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteous sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. But rejoice. Notice he says, but rejoice and be glad. So therefore your reward is great in heaven, for so they... 
persecuted the prophets who were before you. So basically it's saying that Jesus is asking us to rejoice in this persecution. Be excited. Be happy. And James says, consider it pure joy the trials and tribulations you may endure, like we talked about in our previous sermon. But, ladies and gentlemen, be joyful. Be excited that you're going through persecution. Because Jesus is always there for you. But not only that, your reward is in heaven. So be excited to be happy. So, and it also it says, pray for those who persecute you. So all those people, all of those people that persecute you, pray for them. Because it's very important that you pray for them. Nick Ripken mentioned in his book, that when missionaries come and speak in America, that they always ask churches to pray, not that the persecution will stop, but the persecution will give these people the strength and the endurance to continue through. But not only that, Nick Rifkin also mentions in his book, The Insanity of Obedience, that the persecuted ors who are doing the persecuting see Jesus and typically re turn around they reform their lives on God and so it is very important that we understand that persecuting persecution is one going to happen but we have to pray for the people who are persecuting us that they will see God throughout us because that's what the People all around the world, missionary wise, want us to understand that they want us to pray for the people who are persecuting them, that they will see Christ. Love is the prime word that we're going to be talking about here. Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Beware of men. For they will deliver you over counts or courts, excuse me, and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in the hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of the Father speaking through you, brother will deliver a brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Isn't that something? That Jesus says that you will be hated for my name's sake. My name. My name. This is talking about, he's talking to his disciples that you will be hated. You will be despised and you will be rejected. You will be flogged. You'll be dragged out in front of the streets. You'll be beaten. You'll be handed over. And even put to death. And then it talks about that children will rise up against their parents and have their parents be put to death, people. Now, this in this context, it's talking about to the city of to the country of Israel. Excuse me. The country of Israel. It's talking about all these things that will happen to the disciples in context. But not only the application part of this is that we will be persecuted. We will be. There's no getting around that, people. You're going to be persecuted. However, to be persecuted is to be in, this, in the obedience of God. If you're not in the obedience of God and you'll live in a comfortable lifestyle, then you will not be persecuted. And then you'll be living out of God's will. Expect to be persecuted when you're living in the will of God. Because if you're not living in the will of God, again, you will not be persecuted. That's what Jesus is trying to say here. He's telling us, Peter, John, and all the other disciples, Matthew even, 
This is Matthew recording this in the gospel. You will be persecuted. I'm sending you among wolves as sheep. Sheep is really delicious for one thing, and wolves will devour them. So be prepared. But however, Jesus tells his disciples and the Pharisees and all the people to love your neighbor as yourself. Even though you are being persecuted, you do two, three things, two things. You, one, you pray for them. And two, you love them. Now, what does the word love mean? In the Hebrew and the Greek, they both mean sacrificial love. What is sacrificial love? Let's say, let's think about Jesus for a second. Jesus says, love your neighbor. Love, sacrificial love. Being able to lay down one's life for your neighbor as you would yourself. Now, what about the people who doesn't has low self-esteem? Jesus still says that I love you. Therefore, go out and love the world as I have loved you. People, persecution will never end in this world. It will never end. However, we have to pray for the persecuting and the persecutors. And what does that mean? The people whether they're Muslim, whether they're gay people persecuting Christians for their beliefs, whether they're atheists for persecuting the Christians for other things, or other different things. But if you are living in the obedience of God, being obedient, following the Lord where he takes you you will be persecuted life will not be easy for you if you try to live an easy life you will find out quickly that you will be living in the outside of the obedience of God now let's talk about the different Christians in this world because Nick Ripken mentions four different types of Christians and let me pull it up on my tablet, because I have his book on my tablet, and I'll mention, I'll give all the credit to him, because he is a great, phenomenal writer, and he refers to the four types of Christians. Okay, four different types of Christians. There are senses Christians, and I'll spell it to you out in the description part of the video. Senses Christians are people who, if asked about their religion, would say, Christian, this designation might not relate at all to anything that these people believe or even practice. Often, this is the cultural answer. If asked about their religion in certain geographic areas, for example, many people might answer, of course I'm a Christian, isn't everybody? These people, according to Marshall's, are census Christian. Now, Nick Ripken noted this to, about Marshall. So, the guy is named Marshall. This is Marshall's four categories of Christians. But census Christians, on a census, these people would check this Christian box. What that designation actually means is anybody's guess. Okay, so that's the first type of Christian. The second type of Christian, member Christians claim some sort of identification with a particular Christian institution or organization. Again, this does not mean that these people necessarily participate or even that they show up at their churches. These people simply have some sort of personal connection with a church and they identify themselves with the church. They might say, I am Catholic or I am Baptist or I am Methodist. That's the second one. The third one is a practicing Christian. Now I want you to listen to the last two, particularly practicing Christian and the next one. Actually participate in the life of a church. They typically attend worship services in some fashion. 
these people are involved in the forms and rituals of life and of, of the faith. Often, their connection with the church is limited to weddings, baptisms, and funerals. Okay, believers or committed believers. Now, listen to this closely. Are people for whom the Christian faith is central and shaping. These Christians strive to live out their faith and communicate their faith to others. To use the language of the evangelical world, these people have a personal relationship with Jesus. Often... They will use the language of John 3. If you don't know what that is, I will also post that in the description box as well. And talk about being born again. And there's one more category. Hidden Christians are people who believe secretly. Fearful of persecution, these people keep their faith to themselves. In some settings, these believers might keep their faith secret from the government officials and employers. In some other settings, they might keep their faith secret from even family members and friends. These believers might not even experience specific acts of outward persecution, but the fear of persecution has caused their faith to be completely inward instead of outward. For the most part, their faith, though real, is hidden. In most cases, they have not joined a church though this might be an artificial measurement since, excuse me, in many settings, there is no official institutional church to join. Which Christian, which type of Christian is you? There's five that that went through. That, that's five. There's the census Christians. There's the member Christians. There's the practicing Christians. And there is the believers Christians or the committed, and then the hidden. Which one of these are you? I encourage you to look in your soul and seek out who you are in Christ. But always keep in mind that persecution will always endure, will always continue, it will never end. But through the pain and through the persecution, pray for those who persecute you and then love on them. It is so hard for me to say that for radical Muslims, I do love them. I do care about them tremendously. And I would desire to see them come to Christ. That should be a outlook of all Christians. Rather than, let's go over there and destroy them all. Yes. But pray for them. And love on them. Christians, we have them coming here for a purpose. Whether or not you agree with it, they're coming. And whether or not you think they're radical or not, it doesn't matter in the eyes of the Lord. You, it is your place to share your faith with them. Be obedient to the Lord. He has called us on a great commission to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus has taught his disciples. And we see that written in all the four Gospels of the Bible. Are you ready? Which Christian are you? Always keep in mind that persecution is real. It's going to happen. Churches, get ready for it. Because if you are not ready for it, then you, you have a rude awakening. Because persecution is coming, and it's coming rapidly quick. Christians all over the country are dying, being martyred all over the all over the world for their faith. But they're also seeing a tremendous amount of people who are being who are persecuting them come to the faith. Why? Because they pray for them and they love on them as Christ has loved them. I encourage you 
to look in your hearts and search for what kind of Christian are you? Don't just be a census Christian. Don't be a member Christian. And even to the point, don't be a practicing Christian. But be a believer who follows Christ, who is willing to follow him to the ends of the world, whether or not you have persecution or not. But be ready. Love on your neighbors as yourself and pray for those who persecute you. Thank you. And I really hope this encouraged you today and for all eternity. May God bless his holy and mighty word. Thank you.